Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Filter. On this show, we recognize that the world can be a confusing place to live in. And so what I seek to do on this show is to equip you to live with biblical clarity in our confusing world so that you can face the chaos of life with wisdom, integrity, and courage. We are faced with dozens of decisions in everyday life. But on top of these mundane daily decisions, we have large questions to answer and choices to make. These moments of decision making can be some of the most challenging yet most rewarding times in our lives. My guest on today's show seeks to help you to think better about decision making, what it means to seek God in decision making, and how to work a better process for big decisions. Her name is Amy Joseph, and we discussed her new book, Demystifying Decision Making, A Practical Guide. Amy Joseph has spent many years directing women's discipleship and ministry at Redeemer Presbyterian Church and in in campus outreach in San Diego. She and her husband are currently in the process of planning Center City Church in their neighborhood. She's also a regular blogger, and you can find the link to her blog in the show notes. Before we get into this episode, I'm excited to tell you about the new giveaway that we're doing here on Filter. I've partnered with my friends at Stay Forth Designs to give away three copies of their fantastic journal called the Right Side Up Journal. If you want to be one of those winners to get one of those three copies, just go to the link in the description below uh, in the, or in the show notes to enter for your chance to win. You can do that anytime between now and this Friday, April 29th. Like I said, we'll be choosing three winners to receive a copy of their free journal. It's an excellent journal, and I love it because it's, it helps you with your daily productivity and planning out your day, thinking through big questions, big tasks that you have to do each day, but it also allows for creative thinking. They have some big quick picture questions for you to think through, different exercises to work through, ways to track the things that you're learning. Uh, And then there's also quarterly, monthly, weekly planning. It's excellent. I love it. So go enter for your chance to win this excellent resource now. It'll really help you out. Uh, The right side of journal from Stay Forth Designs. Just enter at the link in the description below or in the show notes for your chance to win. Lastly, let me encourage you to subscribe to our email list so that you can get all of the latest content sent directly into your inbox. Just visit the link in the show notes and you can sign up on my website. Also, be sure that you're subscribed to Filter wherever you get your podcasts so that you can get all future episodes right on your homepage. If you're helped by this content, we really appreciate it if you left us a rating and review and shared the show with your friends. Leave Filter a five-star rating on Spotify and write a review on Apple Podcasts. These simple steps will only take a minute of your time, but they greatly help us to get the message of biblical clarity out to more people. Well, without any further delay, let's jump into this conversation that I got to have with Amy Joseph. Amy, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, well, it's a pleasure to have you on. I've been looking forward to it. I've been reading your book that we're talking about today which is called uh, Demystifying Decision-Making, a Practical Guide. I've been really enjoying it. Uh, it, is, it. It's everything that it promises to be by the title. Uh, it helps you to work through the decisions and so on. It's very practical. Before we get into the book, though, tell us about what led you to writing a book on decision-making. Yes. Yeah, so my husband and I were involved in college ministry for about, he for about 25 years and me with him for the past 17 years. Um, so when you do college ministry, you live with people who are literally at the crossroads of thousands of significant decisions. And so at some point in our ministry, we realized we were having the same conversation every week with like 20 different people. Um, and we we recognize one, that this is an incredible inroads to the gospel. Everyone makes decisions and uh, not just college students, though that's very felt in that, you know, wet cement kind of season of life. Um, but people, people want to make good decisions whether they're they're walking with Christ or not. And so we actually found that this was a great 
kind of segue into sharing about our beliefs and who we were as believers and how that shaped the way we made decisions. And so I would say kind of twofold. One is the college experience um, and and hearing students go, I have no idea, no, no bearings to make decisions outside of maybe self-help books or blogs or social media influencers. Um, but there was no theological foundation underneath it. And so we, we found that we are constantly explaining you know, the, the revealed and the secret will of God. And we felt like we were constantly explaining that God's will for us is our sanctification. Um, and we thought, oh, this would be a really good thing to kind of compile. And then the second part was now that we live in San Diego, my husband and I are church planters. And that when, when you start talking about decision making, people lean in. And they want to know, they want to understand because they have questions and a real felt need. And um, getting to write this book was a helpful, okay, how do I use this in conversations to point people back to uh, their desire for transcendence and their desire for for God, especially in a very post-Christian city on the, on the West Coast? Yeah. Yeah. So all of the life experience you had ministering college students uh, gave you a lot of equipping that you needed in order to uh, write a book like this. But what about in your own personal lives? How, how has decision making in your own personal lives as uh, individuals and as a family impacted the way that you uh, or, really, or, or shaped you and then ended yeah. up shaping this book? Yeah, for sure. Um, well, you know, the thing about decision making is sometimes, you know, when you're making a huge decision. And sometimes you're just making what you think is a small decision and it shapes things far beyond what you'd imagine. And so um, for sure, lots of decisions as a family, particularly around ministry, calling. Um, We moved our family from the Southeast over to Southern California, which was a major culture shift um, to bring the gospel to the, you know, the post-Christian West. And um, that was a huge, Lord, are you in this? Or is this what you're calling us to do? And and how do we know? And will you give us um, confirmation? And so kind of walking through that and then, and then having children as a mother, I feel like decision-making is magnified. My decisions for my children and then teaching them and equipping them how to make decisions, especially in our present culture where decisions are everywhere. My kids are constantly bombarded with choices that my, my, my husband didn't have, I didn't have, his parents most assuredly didn't have growing up in India. And so, yeah, we, we are living in kind of in the crucible of decision making and wanting to equip ourselves and our children really well to make decisions on the daily, because it's really the daily decisions that shape our lives. Honestly, sometimes more yeah. the habits, the ri- the ruts of righteousness that shape our lives more than sometimes the really big decisions that we lose sleep over. Yeah, so. yeah, absolutely. And when we consider what is God's desire for us in decision making, there's uh, there's a quote that you had that you have in here. I'm just gonna, let me give me give me a second to find it because I highlighted it. I really, here we go. Yeah. Um, really love this quote. And there's a couple others that were similar, but you said in the process of making decisions, we can fixate on the product or even the desired clarity. However, God enjoys the entire process, in which we learn to trust him as children. And so mm-hmm. God has a, uh, even bigger desire for us in decision-making that, that goes beyond even what comes out of making that decision. And whenever we understand God's desire for us in that, then, uh, yeah, even the smaller decisions of life do matter. Can you just expound on that? What is God's desire for us in decision making? Absolutely. Um, I, I just think one, you know, kind of to set the stage, we live in an incredibly product oriented culture. So Amazon Prime, I can order something in literally in two hours because I live in San Diego. It will be on my doorstep. Um, We love product. We love finished product. We love shiny. We love flashy. We love sexy. That's kind of what we're we're primed to enjoy. And and I think everything about what God reveals himself to us in the scriptures is that he is a God who enjoys process, Um, that he creates seeds that grow into trees. Like this organic processes are all around us in the natural natural world and the natural world is meant to point us to his cre- his created order um, but also to the heart of the creator and so our god is a god of process um, organic slow process and so i just constantly have to tell my m- myself my own heart my 
children, God cares about the process. We want to rush through and get to the end. We want to get the grade. We want to finish the term paper. We want to be able to say certificate done, did it. And and God is is far less concerned with that than we are. He enjoys being with us. And I think that's what's astounding to me about, about decision-making is I, I, like I said in that quote, I fixate on, okay, what do I need to do about this? And God is saying, I just want you to enjoy me right now. I just want you to be with me. Um, and, and kind of an illustration of that would be um, when my children were little, I had this profound experience with the Lord because one of my children is just a busybody. He's constantly on the go. He's an achiever. He's doing all the time. And the only times I can get him to be still are when he's sick or when he falls asleep. You know, we're out too late <laughs> hanging out with friends and he falls asleep on my shoulder and he's just dead weight. And um, in that moment, I feel like the Lord was kind of, the spirit was kind of prodding me and saying, this is how, this is how it is with you. Like you are so busy all the time being so product oriented, trying to get things done. And you forget that I actually love just, to, just to be with you. Like sometimes I just want you to be dead weight and I just want to hold you. And I want you to, to need me and I want to be your father <laughs> and I want you to be my daughter and I want you to let me be who I love to be. And, um, so when it comes to decision-making, just that imagery of like, he just loves to be with us. And the decision making is just setting the stage for him to reveal our hearts and our idols and for him to get us to lean into the scriptures and to ask good questions of him and what he's doing and to see from his perspective. When you, when you think about decision making from that perspective, it takes the pressure cooker, you know, like the Instapot release thing, so some of the pressure out of decision making and i think it 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 points us back to intimacy with the godhead which is what this life's about right that's what we're here really for is to to enjoy god and to to make him known um the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. That's what we're here for. And not to get all our decisions perfectly right and not to check the boxes and not to be the most successful version of ourselves, but to know and enjoy God. And I think that perspective shifts the way we think about decision making. Mm. So what would you say to someone who says, I hear what you're saying and I, and I like it, but God cares about the product too, right? I mean, like he cares that he cares like that we're going the right direction uh, and so I'm still concerned with making the right decision at the end of the day. So it seems as though Absolutely. there's a tension between the process and product or between the leaning into God, but then also like taking that step whenever I think he's calling me to take that step or, uh, or, and so on. And so what, how would you address that person that says, like, I agree, but I still feel this like tension between the process and the product? Yeah, I think, and I think the tension is inherent in it. So I think that's good. If you're feeling that, that's probably right. But I, I hear underneath that question, Aaron, the the thought of, okay, so we're just going to think and enjoy God all the time. Or are we just going to live these mystical lives? Like I have decisions to make. I have to, I have deadlines to make. I have to, I have to decide if I'm going to buy the house or if I'm going to go through with the foster process or like there are actual practical decisions that we have to make. And you know who I find in, in the scriptures to be the most compelling and the most balanced of living in that tension is Nehemiah. So Nehemiah faced with an incredible situation. I mean, he's, he's got the job. I mean, he's, he's the man. Um, and cut bear to the King, you know, position, posture, all of the things that, that you would think he would want. And then he's faced with this moment where God's people are devastated that the, you know, Israel's walls are completely broken down and he's at this crossroads and, and Nehemiah has this beautiful interaction of prayer and intimacy and then practicality. So he prays, he prays all night and he seeks the Lord and he mourns and he laments at the, the state of Israel. And then he writes letters and says, Hey, can we borrow some wood from your kingdom to build the wall. And so throughout the entire book of Nehemiah, I feel like you see someone living in that tension of intimacy with God, the process and product. We've got a wall to build y'all. Everybody get on your spot on the wall, you know, sword in one hand, trowel in the other, we're building a wall. And so I, if you're feeling tension, I think that's right. It's, it's when you're not feeling the tension, if you're only on the product side or you're only on the process side, oh, I'm just going to sit here and twiddle my thumbs. No, uh, Matthew eleven twelve. For since for from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of God has been forcefully advancing, and forceful men lay hold of it. 
that is that is the talk of action. That is mm. not the talk of contemplation alone, right? Yeah. So there's there's kingdom work to be done, and there's an urgency to the kingdom work that we have to do here, which means we need to make decisions. But I think if you miss the process part and the, the heart of God behind the decision making, I just don't think you're going to have the same effective effectiveness and enjoyment in actually doing the process, the getting towards the product. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I think it's just, it's a good reminder that decision making is a part of our sanctification. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Because I don't think, I mean, watching, even with my children, watching them make decisions about schooling and soccer soccer teams, which soccer team to try out for, and should they go to this party or should they not go to that birthday party? Um, you, you get a window into someone's heart, their values, even their idols, um, their personality when they're making a decision. You mm. see the hesitations. Why are you hesitating about that? What are you afraid of? And and I guess that's what I'm saying when I say the process. Like God is after that because that's the stuff of sanctification. And he yeah. wants us to be conformed to him. And, you know, it says in Corinthians, you have the mind of Christ. Like I've given you the spirit. You can think the way Christ thinks. Uh, mm-hmm. You can make decisions the way Christ would make decisions because you have the spirit indwelling and you have these guiding principles. Um, and to me, that's that takes it from decisions are a problem to be solved and it shifts it into they are a privilege to be stewarded like yeah that's good we are we are made in god's image and so we get to make decisions not that decision making fatigue of modern world which says oh i have to make another decision mm-hmm. oh, i have to make another decision yeah yeah and and also putting decision making back into the box of sanctification i think also helps us to uh, be protected from starting to see our personal value and identity in the decisions that we make. Because so often I think, and I see this in my own life, I I tend to be a a perfectionist and I tend to be someone who, um, who is tempted to find value in what I can accomplish. Mm -hmm. So then a lot of decisions that I make, even ones that shouldn't be so weighty, I end up putting way more weight into uh, because more than just practicalities are involved. It's, it's my it's my image, my self worth, and all that gets wrapped up in it. Uh, and so my heart isn't in the gospel, and it's not in uh, Lord. What are you doing in me through the decision, and not just what can I accomplish? And then maybe put a good uh, religious or theological <laughs> label on it afterwards after I've made myself look good. Yeah, that's so true because it is. It's an identity level thing. Like we have to get the in, in the right order. And our identity, when our identity is secure in Christ, we have freedom to make decisions. And we say this all the time in our family. We have freedom to fail. <laughs> we have freedom to fail. Where I'm a perfectionist, and I'm raising a little, a few little perfectionists. And so it's just this a constant fear of um, man's approval or feel feel a fear of um, failure fear fear of not living up and and it keeps us bound and I think um, you know when you think about the parable of the talents Jesus had the the sharpest words for the ones who said misjudge the character of God and then refuse to risk in light of that um, because he said I thought you were a hard master so I didn't want to lose my money and, yeah. and the ones he rewarded were the ones who said we knew the kind of master you were and so we felt the freedom to risk and to make choices and to to make some potential return on your investment or maybe lose some investment but God was less concerned about the, the return and he was more concerned about their understanding of his nature and their willingness to risk and invest that which had been entrusted to them so absolutely, when we understand that this is part of our sanctification and that our identity is secure, it is rock solid, um, that we are not the sum of our decisions. And and that's hard because our culture says you are the sum of your decisions, yeah. every one of them. And the gospel is so radically, scandalously freeing to say, you're the sum of Christ's decisions, not yours. Um and that that allows us to make decisions that I think honor God and advance the kingdom. Yeah, absolutely. I think that one of the parts that people struggle with the most or seem to be the most uh, mystifying, go back to the title of the book, <laughs> uh, is trying to figure out God's will. Like, what is it? What is it? What does that mean? God's will. And then how do I discern it when I'm trying to make decisions? What are some of the ways that you uh, help people to understand what God's will means and how we discern God's will in decision-making. Yeah, 
Absolutely. Well, you know, it's funny how such a simple conversation starter, right? Decisions we're making actually get us back to some really deep bedrock theology. So that, you know, our theology matters. Um, and so because when you when you talk about making decisions, you are effectively asking what is, what's God's will? And I want to line up with it. And so that's a big theological question. Uh, And one of the reasons we wanted to, I wanted to write this book was a lot of the books out there are incredibly practical, but there's not a theological kind of meat to it and, or incredibly theological and you're lost somewhere up in the Trinity. But then you're like, well, what does this actually mean? And so we're trying to find that middle ground of, okay, we we need to understand some of these theological realities and mysteries so that we can make practical decisions. Um, And so one of the things that you bump into when you think about decisions as a believer is, well, do my decisions matter? Because you're you're bumping into another tension or mystery, and that's God's sovereignty and man's responsibility. So that's the first one I feel like practically we bump into. Well, if God is sovereign, if God is in control of every of every quark and every quail and of every star and every starling, if if God's in charge of all of those things and He knows all of that and He's 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 got plans that are you know Psalm thirty three, the plans of His heart will never be thwarted. He frustrates the counsel of the people then why, why, why do I care what decisions I make? And so there's this tension between God is sovereign and man is responsible. So we have moral agency. What we do matters, and God uses our decisions in his sovereign plan for the kingdom of God. And so that's the tension. And and you could you could think yourself into the ground on that one, trying to figure it out. Um, so two helps on that. One is it's a tension and it's a mystery and we don't have to solve mystery. Um, if, if they didn't, you know, the most brilliant thinkers, theological minds haven't figured this one out. We're not going to figure it out on this podcast. And my, my kids aren't going to figure it out about their soccer decision. Mm. Um, when we encounter mystery in Christianity, A.W. Tozier says the first thing we should do is kneel and say, God, not try to figure it out. Like we have to be comfortable with mystery in our faith because at the center of our faith is a triune God where we say he is one, but he is three. He is three, but he is one. And the most important significant turning point of human history is the incarnation of Christ, who is a hundred percent man and a hundred percent God. Yeah. So we have to be able to hold both of those. And we don't like, we don't like both ends. We like an either or. So when we're tempted to, when we were facing a mystery like God's sovereignty and man's responsibility, we want to truncate it. We innately truncate it. We either go, God is sovereign or man is responsible. And I do this on the daily. I flip back and forth. And so the image that helps me the most is actually from A.W. Tozier. And he says that uh, you're like a little birdie and uh, the bird has two wings. And so God is sovereign. He's in complete control. He's going to take care of these decisions. If if my kid goes to this program or takes this AP course and doesn't take, take it this AP course, it's not going to throw off his sovereign plan for the universe. And yet, as a mom, I'm responsible to help my child make decisions that are going to set him up effectively for the future. Which one's true? They're both true. And so you can't fly if you only flap one wing. You have to have both wings flapping to fly. Hmm. God is sovereign and man is responsible. And so both are true at the exact same time. So I think that's the first kind of theological conundrum we bump into. And then underneath that one is God's will. What is God's will? Um, And and we talk a lot about discerning God's will. Um, We want to discover God's will. Those are kind of the words we use when we talk about God's will. Um, But I think the the theological help there is, is understanding this distinction that there is the revealed will of God and the secret will of God or hidden. There's a couple different ways you could say it, but I think in the book I use revealed and hidden. And the revealed will of God is his word. He told us, this is what I want. (laughs) This is what I'm like. Uh, And so if you want to know what his will is, his will is for you to be sanctified. His will is for you uh, to forgive 70 times seven. His will is for you to become conformed to the image of Christ. His will is for you to pray for your enemies. His will is for you to forbear. His will is for you to have patient hope in tribulation. That's his will for you. Those are clear. We know that. And so sometimes when we think about decisions, we get stuck on the all that we don't know, right? I don't know where my kids are going to go to college. I don't know when my my father-in-law is going to pass away from Parkinson's. I don't, there's so much I don't know what's crippling. 
But the scriptures tell us that what you do know is, is empowering and it's practical. And you've been given all you need for life and for godliness. Mm-hmm. We have been given all we need in the revealed will of God. So that's the revealed will. And then there's the hidden will of God. And the hidden will of God, we cannot know until we're looking back on it. Right. So for example, college decisions for me, wanted to go to Duke, was desperate to go to Duke. That was my like my dream. Got waitlisted, ended up at this little college called Presbyterian College, this teeny little school. They paid for everything. Duke was waitlisting me and gonna make me be in debt for years. So I ended up at this this school, was so upset about it. Looking back on it, it's so obvious to me. That's where I grew in my faith. That's where I met my husband. It's so clear <laughs> that that was God's will for me. Yeah. But when I was making that decision, it was not clear. <laughs> yeah. And so the hidden will of God, we don't get to know until we're looking back on it. So we're wasting our time trying to kind of finger into something that's not for us to figure out. God would have us walk by faith in light of the revealed will of God. Um so yeah, and the, and the scripture that helps me with that, like a practical help is Deuteronomy 29, 29, where Moses is talking to the people of God and he says, for the secret things belong to the Lord, but the revealed things belong to us and to our children that we might obey them and live forever. Yeah. So I'm like, it's okay to think about the secret things. It's good for us to be a thinking people, but we've got to flip back down into what we do know. There's a lot we don't know. We got to come back to what we do know. And what we do know is the revealed will of God through his word. Hey guys, just a quick break to talk to you about my new sponsor here on the podcast, Zencaster. Zencaster is the tool that I use to record the remote interviews that I do here for the podcast. Whenever I decided that I was going to start doing remote interviews, talking to people who I would have to do over uh, over the internet, I looked at several different tools. I didn't want to use Zoom because honestly, Zoom just doesn't give you a really good quality product at the end in terms of uh, audio and video quality. I looked at some of the other uh, services out there, but I didn't find anything that was easy to use and that worked as well as Zencaster. I love Zencaster because they have tools for running post-production. They give you separate audio and video files for both you and your guests, uh, and they come all in super high quality, crystal clear audio, HD video that you can't get from using other uh, over the internet uh, streaming services. I love Zencaster and Zencaster is offering my listeners a 30% off of their pro plan for three months whenever you use my link to sign up. So just go to the link that I have in the description below or in my show notes and you can sign up for a free trial of Zencaster and then to get 30% off your first three months with a pro account. I love Zencaster. I've been using them uh, for the podcast for uh, at least a year now and I highly recommend them. So go uh, and sign up through that link so that you can get 30% off your Zencaster Pro account. Now, let's get back into this episode. Yeah. Yeah, one thing that I thought was really good uh, in the book was how you said, or particularly in this section, was um, you said how God rev- tells us a lot more about what he wants us to do today than what he wants mm. us to do tomorrow. That's right. Yeah. Yep. Which is, isn't that freeing though, to know that? Like, I don't know my kid's future. That's the one I'm feeling because I have almost have high schoolers now. Um, I don't know what's going to happen to my father-in-law who's, who's very sick with Parkinson's disease, but I do know how to love my children today. And I do know how to serve and pray for my father-in-law today. And that frees us. And it, it lines back up with what Jesus said, even on the Sermon on the Mount, right? Like, um, do not be anxious about these things. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all the other things will be added unto you. You don't have to chase after those things like the pagans do. You have a father who's going to provide for you. Now live in light of him, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then even if you continue in the sermon or uh, continue or go backwards, I'm getting it out of order uh, with the Lord's prayer. The Lord's prayer is before that, the part that you just referenced. Uh, or is it after? Oh, no, this well, is I think it's de- different gospels. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, but in the Lord's prayer, everything that Jesus instructs us to pray for uh nearly every single point is for the day mm. and yep. and not focusing on uh, bring this or make that happen in my future and open this door. Uh, but instead of just asking God to help us to glorify himself and to mm. uh, guide us, protect us today. Give us I what we need that. for today. 
And and doesn't that freeze us? I mean, I just remember being new to the faith and thinking, I want to I want to be like Amy Carmichael, and I want to be like Elizabeth Elliot, who are some of my heroes, and Corey Ten Boom, and and a mentor wisely saying, Amy, a faithful minute turns into a faithful day, turns into a faithful week, year. 10 years, life. And so, yeah, if I want to be on track to making decisions that honor God, I start with, what do I do for the next 20 minutes? Do I scroll mindlessly on my phone or do I put my phone away and actually pray for my children? Or, you know, do we um, sacrifice everything at the the altar of of youth sports or do we say, no, we're going to pass on these opportunities because we trust the Lord with our child's future and we're not trying to make his way to, to get a college scholarship. God's going to open up doors, right? So like that, that focusing on the little decisions now set us up for the big decisions that are coming. Um, and most of those are in disguise. A lot of times we don't know when it's a big decision. (laughs) It just kind of is. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, we can make some small decisions that end up opening doors we didn't realize to much bigger ones. Exactly. Like I've, my, I always tell people, one of my, some of the people in our church, a couple that we got to see come to know Christ 10 years ago, you know, he said, I made this de- weird decision during the day to go to the dog park. I never went to the dog park to walk my dog. And I met my wife there. Like one of those little, like, you know, like we're just, yeah. we are so small and God is so gracious and so in control of our lives. Yeah. And I think that last word is where it like, it really comes down to, especially with trying to discern God's will and so on is the issue of control. I think very often we're not really looking for God's will as much as we are really just looking for control. And, uh, and so whenever you said before how God just telling us what we need to do today can be so freeing. You know, I was thinking, or on the other hand, if you're a control freak, terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> so which true. Is that my, is which so is my true. experience. <laughs> no, and it is. It's and but but it at least it can it. lead to freedom. It can lead to freedom. It can lead to freedom. But yeah. you're right. I do think a lot of times what we're after is control. Like even just before this podcast, I was sitting there confessing my sin to the Lord about my children and wanting to control their lives and wanting to protect them from suffering and wanting all these good wants, but feeling like the image that God gave me was, you know, the the thought of potter and clay, you know, I'm the potter, you are the clay. And I am, you know, God's got these little clumps of clay that are my children or my, you know, my spouse, whatever it is, the thing that I'm, my job, my future, my education, and uh, and he's got his shaping hands and I'm behind him me in my pride, trying to kind of shape his hands to help shape, help the sovereign God of the universe, help shape the situation. Like you probably might want to go a little bit like this. And when you think of it like that, you just go, how prideful of me, how pride, who am I? You know, when God says to Job, who is this who can confuse his counsel, right? Like who is, who are you to come in here and tell me the sovereign, good, gracious God of the universe, how I'm to do what I'm going to do in their lives. That is not your place. And so I think it's a, actually a lot of pride um, yeah. and a lot of self-absorption uh, um, and and thinking way too highly of ourselves and not nearly highly enough of God that yeah. makes us want to control. And, you know, the, the control is so closely related to fear. And and what does First John tell us about, about fear? He says, there is no fear in love, for perfect love casts out fear. Those who fear are not protect, not perfected in love. And so when I get into those control cycles and those fear cycles, when we talk about making decisions, I think it's actually an invitation for God to say, ooh, there's some control and some fear here. Where are you not believing who I say I am? Where are you not believing the gospel? Where are you not believing the character and the goodness of God? Because um, that's exposing, you know, um, Soren Kierkegaard said that anxiety is the smoke, smoke screen to the collapse of an idol. So it's the smoke signal that shows us Oh, there's something going on deeper in the surface. And so when control, when I want to manipulate my children's futures to to make them successful, or when we're afraid we're going to fail, God is saying, hey, there's more going on here and you're not trusting my character. So it's a, it, it's an invitation to more deeply understand the love that God has for us. At least that's what I think the Apostle John is talking about in 1 John 4. Yeah. 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 And that that's so good. In the book, as you move on from the theological foundation considerations for decision making, you start to move into the practical, um, building on that. One of the first things you talk about is reading the gauges, Mm. uh, reading the gauges of decision making. 
And I thought that was that was really helpful, something that I hadn't considered before. At, at first, when I started that chapter, I was like, I was like, oh, this kind of seems like it's it's a, it's a filler chapter. <laughs> like just you gotta, meet, <laughs> you gotta meet the word count. And, and until <laughs> until I kept reading it, and I was like, okay, no, this is actually really helpful. This is this this is good. Uh, so talk to us about uh, that idea of reading the gauges when it comes to decision making. Yeah, yeah. The, um, so we have a friend who is in flight school. And he was studying, you know, these crazy amounts of stuff. So be assured that these people that fly these planes we get in, they do a lot of hard work. Um, but he was talking about the gauges, all of the gauges that they have to learn to read and to trust. And um, and it gave such a good, helpful imagery of decision making. Because I think what happens when we make decisions is we all have a dashboard of decisions kind of in our cockpit. And and so much of the time, making a decision is actually just looking at each of the different gauges and and kind of gathering a read on each one of them. And so um, in the book, I talk about the center has to be the gospel gauge, like, you know, trying to make decisions without being made right with God first is, is going to miss the point <laughs> most of the time um, because of what we just talked about, the identity stuff and the fear stuff, all of those like identity level issues. But then there are some other gauges. So one of the gauges we talk about was the cultural gauge. Um, and then that one is understanding, you know, there's kind of three main types of culture, um, fear, power, honor, shame, guilt, innocence. And each one of those affects which depending on which one we we're primarily raised in, yeah. and you probably have a primary and a secondary, and then one that feels really foreign to you. Um, but their approach to decision-making is different. So if you live in a guilt, innocence culture, the question you're asking, is this right or is this wrong? That is not the question, the main leading question that um, an, an honor shame culture is asking. They're asking, how does this reflect upon my community and my family? Yeah. What is this what is this going to make others l think about us? That's the first question. That's the most important question if you live in an honor shame culture. Uh fear power culture. Um is this set me up to be under evil spirits or under wrong powers? Um how does this posture me um in light of the power struggle that I live in? So it's it, you have to understand that your cultural gauge actually makes a difference in the way you make decisions. Um American Western culture is so highly independent. It's you do you, whatever you want. Um, that's new. That's new for most of human history, has not had that much freedom. And so just recognizing that your your family of origin, your culture, um, that's your primary culture, your shaping culture, they they play a, um, a pretty significant role in how we make, make decisions. And so we yeah. have to factor that in. Um, we talk about the personality gauge. Like, are you, are you uh, risk averse or are you um, pleasure seeking? Or are you, are you the type that types to, tends to want to run away and start over? If you are that type, then the caution for you is slow down ask a lot of questions, or if you're risk averse, maybe maybe you need to push forward. So you have to understand that. Um, you have to understand your idols. I think this was the most challenging for me was how much of an outsized voice our idols have in the way we make decisions. And you mentioned it earlier, Aaron, like if you're a perfectionist, how am I going to look? Am I going to look out of control when I make this? Um, is this going to make me fail? And what does that say about me? Um, if you're If you're a comfort person, you make decisions based on comfort more than you make decisions based on what God is calling you to walk into through his word and through obedience and what the spirit is prompting you to do. You quench the spirit because you want comfort. Um, if you're success driven, it's I want to climb the ladder and it doesn't matter, you know, who, who gets smushed in the process. And so we, to understand our driving idols, like what are the things that are the main hungers of my heart for me? It's significance. I want to be significant. Um, and I want to, I want to achieve. Achieving is really high for me, so I can fill my schedule with things that I don't need to be doing, um, because it look makes me look good, yeah. or it makes me feel good, it makes me feel accomplished, rather than waiting when God wants me to wait. So I think understanding the different voices, and then your circumstances, what's going on around you, um, God's priorities. There's all different kinds of gauges, but I think just when you make a decision, it all kind of rolls together into this giant knot and it feels so impossible to approach. Mm. But when you do the dashboard of decisions, you can kind of break it down into some more approachable sections and go, okay, how much of this is this? How much of this is this? How much of this is this? Yeah. Um, and then ask God to kind of help you right size some of those gauges so that the idolatry gauge is much smaller and the gospel gauge is much larger. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, that's good. And that's what I came to realize as I was reading that chapter and saw the value in it and realized, okay, this is this is really, really good because I, I like the way you put it just now. It does it helps to untangle. Yeah. So like some of the things that you're feeling as you're trying to work through a decision. Uh, like you might in, intuitively, I guess, depending on how self aware you are, you might intuitively understand like, ah, there's some different different things going on here. There's some different dynamics happening in, in my heart and mind as I'm rushing through the, or not rushing through, working through this decision. And so, yeah, the gauges help to untangle it, as you said. But do you, do you give this much um, self introspection to every decision that you make or, or does it, does it vary? Absolutely varies. I mean, goodness, if you did that, you would be paralyzed. That's the whole analysis paralysis thing. And so, you know, like, do I want the burrito? Do we want to go to Chipotle or Chick-fil-A? Um, you know, should we go to this kid's birthday party? Should we not? Um, should I read this book or should I read this book next? Those decisions, I think we we tend to make those fairly intuitively. And actually, some secular authors have done some really interesting research on how we actually make those little decisions um, and that we often actually don't make them from reason. We make them from an intuition, like our, our emotions um, decide almost before our brain can catch up. And then our brain yeah. just kind of makes a reasoning in light of what we want, which is really fascinating. Mm -hmm. So on those smaller ones, I think we trust the systems that God has put in place, Um but I think the bigger the decision and the more lasting the consequences, the, the more significant the process ought to be. Um, and just slowing down. So moving our family across the country, do you go to seminary or do you, do you get a job in the marketplace? Do you, um, yeah, do you have biological children or you, those are pretty significant decisions. And so to slow down and to, to ask and to, to give due diligence to the process of making those decisions, um, rather than getting it stuck in analysis paralysis from all the little decisions. And I think yeah. that's the challenge in our culture is the decision-making fatigue. We're just tired of making decisions because yeah. when I go to the cereal aisle, I literally have hundreds of choices like organic, not organic. If it's organic, do I want the sugary kind or the non-sugary kind? Do I want the big frosted mini wheats or the small, the chocolate or the blueberry? Yeah. It's insane. And so I think all of that fatigue affects us when we come to the really big decisions. We just don't want to think about it. We just want someone to make the decision for us. Um, and we we kind of endure the process rather than enjoy it. Um, when I, again, back to the whole, I think it's an invitation to be invited into the Trinitarian dialogue, to be part of what, how God thinks and to be part of fellowship with him. It's just that slowing it down so I can actually enjoy him and see what he might be up to in my life rather than just plowing through the next decision to move on to the next thing. Yeah. Yeah. And then you move on into the practical preparations for decision making. And I thought that was really valuable because like you said before, it's, it's easy for there to be like Christian living books out there that go really in depth on God's will and, uh, and you know, maybe even talk about this, uh, l checking your heart for idolatry or sin, and then just kind of leave you there as if that's enough to then make your decision based off of, but you give some practical steps. Can you share what, what are some of those practical steps that uh, people can take whenever they are preparing to make a decision? Yeah. 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 For, I mean, one of them is pray. I mean, obviously, which we say that like it's reflexive, but it's not reflexive in our heart often. Take some time to actually pray and say, God, I actually want your wisdom. <laughs> yeah. um, so James 1, 5, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God and he will freely give it without reproach, without shame. Um, and so most of the time I don't have, James also says, because I, I don't ask. I don't ask for it. I don't say, God, I, I need to tap into your storehouses of wisdom. I am imperfect. You are perfect. I am limited. You are unlimited. I am fallible. You are infallible. I live in time. You are outside of time. I need your wisdom. I need you to slow down and settle my heart so I can think straight and think like someone who lives for the kingdom of God. So I think prayer and actually setting aside time to prayer, wrestling out in prayer. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've hit the hiking trail my, with my heart and just a big fat mess over a decision and then spent, walked it out with my feet and prayed it out in my heart and felt so much more peace. Nothing had changed other than Lord, you're with me in this decision and you're going to come with me and, and you have wisdom for me. So I think that, and then we talk, I think I talk about in the book, um, a lot of times decision-making is, is like 
pu- gathering puzzle pieces. So once you have mm. the pieces, it's actually not that hard to make a decision. What's hard is gathering the pieces of information that we need to make the decision. And so um, I think it's important to understand your passions, like who who you are, how has God wired you, um, what what comes naturally to you. God doesn't have to put us in our sweet spot, but He's he's not a masochist. He actually wants us to be free to be who we are and to use our gifts for the kingdom of God. Mm-hmm. So understanding our passions and who we are, understanding our priorities. Um, and I think this is significant because our culture says you can do it all at, at the same time. You can have it all. And, yeah. and that's actually not how we work because we are limited creatures who live in time. Yeah. And so assessing what season of life am I in? And is this, just because this is a passion doesn't mean, so writing, just because this is a passion doesn't mean it's always going to be a priority in my life. Right now I have little children and I want to care for them. That's my priority. So some of these passions are going to be set aside. So that's going to help me make decisions. Well, my priorities in this season are this. And so this decision is no, I can't do that, even though I would love to do that. And my passions line up with that. My priorities don't align with that in this season. So having a clear understanding of what season of life you're in and what your priorities are, um, in light of God's word, and then also just in light of your your circumstances you find yourself in. So talk about your passions, your priorities, and your providential circumstances. Like where do you find yourself? And I think one of the examples I used was for a season there, I really wanted to pursue um, being a genetic counselor because it's such a secular field and you know parents that find out that they have some kind of their children have genetic disorders are often just told just abort. Like, this is fact. You just abort. And to have genetic counselors that actually say, hey, there's actually viable options for you to, to carry this child into, into earth and see how long God will have them to live. Like, that's actually a real option. Wanted to do yes. that. It lined up with God's priorities. It lined up with my my passions and my personality. I'm smart. I can learn. I have a, a tender spot for people with disabilities. But it didn't line up with our providential circumstances. There was no schools within four states of us uh, that had a program, and we had a very clear calling to do college ministry. And so it was like, well, okay, that checked that one right off the box. This isn't possible for us. And so using those categories helps us. Um, I think yeah. seeking counsel is important, and um, and you got to be careful on this one because when you seek counsel, we innately want to seek the counsel that's going to tell us what we want to hear. Yeah. And so we need people, I call it in the book, trusted trespassers, people who are allowed to kind of knock around in the secret rooms of our heart and ask the hard questions like, Amy, I know you like to be busy. Are you doing this because it looks really good? Or are you doing this because God's calling you to do this? Um, so yeah. asking for wise counsel from some trusted trespassers um, and then kind of doing the lay it all out before the Lord back to back to prayer. So we're bookending the process with prayer. Okay, God, in light of all of these things. In light of what so and so said, and, and they have good insight into my life, and in light of what so and so said, and they have good insight into my life, what are you calling me to do? Um, and then give me the strength to obey. Yeah. So I think those are some of the practical things we can do. Yeah. And I think that whenever we take all those steps, and whenever I look at my own life and times that I've taken those steps, often whenever we have the like right counselors and we, we look at our priorities and passions and all that correctly because uh, sometimes we can be working with bad data or maybe not the best counsel. But whenever all those things are done well, often what we find is, uh, like you were saying before, we, it's easy for us to think that we have an infinite number of choices before us. And we get overwhelmed because do I go this way or that way or do this or that? And then we go through that process and we realize, oh, God's really kind of just put like one re- really good option in front of us. <laughs> like... Yeah. Uh, or, or sometimes it's more of like, he's put like two really good options and it's just like, well, well, which one should I go for? Um, rather than three dozen that, uh, that, I, that I need to work through. Um, and he ends up making it clear, uh, as we go through what we talked about at the beginning of this, the process of discerning it with him and using his counsel. I think another, uh, unique feature of your book uh, another one of those chapters that surprised me i was like oh okay i wouldn't have expected this but this make this makes sense in a book on decisions is what do you do after you've made your decision yes yes and i was like I think, oh okay cool so tell us about that yeah so i think what happens is initially especially for the big decisions right not for the guacamole on the burrito decision but mm. for like that oh my goodness do we move our family from a church and a family 
you know, a city that we've known to a whole new place. Um, those kind of decisions. Initially, there's just relief. Oh my goodness, it just so, it feels so good to close that tab that's been open for months of, of consideration and deliberation. It feels so relieving, like, oh, turn it, like kind of like that turning in the term paper when college, like mm. done, done, no more. Um, but I think a few days later, a couple hours later, a few months later, even a few years later, we have a few enemies that kind of pop up on the other side. Uh, one of them is regret. Uh, one of them is like a fear, like, oh, no, what if I didn't make the right decision? One of them is like a FOMO situation, which is really big. So fear of missing out, like, I know I made this decision, but what if I had gone down that path and this would have happened and this would have happened and this would have happened? Um so I think fear, regret, shame, all of those things can come up, especially when we make a poor decision or pride if we made a really good decision and we mm. think, well, I made the right decision. Those other parents, oh my goodness, they should follow me because I did it right. And and how do we then steward our experiences and our past experiences of decision making in a way that honors God? And um, and I think it's important, especially when we talk about regret, um, because yeah. That's a huge one. I mean, I, my husband was doing a, a sermon and he talked about, he did some research and he said that 90% of Americans say that they live with massive life altering regret. Hmm. And that's, I mean, again, you kind of wonder about some of those polls. Like, so let's give or take even 20%. 70% of Americans say they live with massive life altering regret. Yeah. Um, so an abortion made 30 years ago, that's still affecting them today. Um, a failed marriage. That's still affecting them and failing them today. Um, yeah, a, a poor purchase of a Tesla when we didn't need a Tesla. I don't know what it is, but um, what do we do with that regret? Because the gospel gives us something to do with it. It doesn't yeah. make us live in this like self-hatred, loathing, shame. Um, the gospel gives us freedom to move forward. And I, I, you know what I love? I love Thomas in, in the scriptures. He has this moment, you know, they all, Jesus has walked through a wall as a resurrected Jesus into an upper room and everyone's there except for Thomas. And they tell him and he's like, not going to believe it, not going to believe it till I see it. And, and he has this moment with Jesus and, and he basically says, from now on, Thomas, you follow me from now on. And I love that statement from now on. Okay. Yeah. You messed up, Thomas. You demanded signs from me for you to, to trust me. But the, there's that freedom of from now on, walk in, walk in freedom from now on, make a better decision. And so I think there's a great story from Chronicles of Narnia where Edmund, if you know the story, Edmund messes up royally and because of Turkish delight gets stuck with the white witch. And mm -hmm. because of that, Aslan's going to have to die on the stone table. And he's finally been reinstated. It's the end of the story. And everyone's whispering because, you know, he's back in the, in the camp. And, and Aslan just keeps saying, look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me. Don't look at them. Don't listen to them. Look at me, look at me. And I just, that freedom of saying, Hey, I look at the, look at the one who is scarred to forgive you. It is done. It is finished. I have paid for it now. Don't do that again. <laughs> How do we make a better decision in the future? Um, and then if we've made a good decision, um, how do we how do we steward that in a way that glorifies God? And one of my favorite things for that is um, Corey Ten Boom, an, an old dying Corey Ten Boom. Um, she talked about, you know, she would go around and share all these stories and she lived an incredible life of faithfulness in a horrible situation in the concentration camps and loved her enemies in, in incredibly supernatural ways. And, and they said, what do you do, Corey, when you receive all these compliments and all these people say, thank you so much. And your, your life changed me so much. And she says, you know what I do? I gather all those little flowers that people give. And then I, 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 I give them to God as a bouquet and say, here's your flowers. Here's, these are yours. These aren't mine. And so there's such a humility to that and, and a recognition of if I made a decision that honored you, it's because you're gracious. Because John 15 says that apart from you, I can do nothing and that the flesh profits nothing. And I have nothing to offer in my own. But because of your grace, we were able to make good decisions early on in parenting. Thank you, Jesus. Help me to keep doing that. Rather than this, this stench of self-righteousness and pride, yeah. that kind of people smell from a mile away when we make good decisions and have arrived mm. at a, an enviable place. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's so good. And I think that a, 
a part of decision making because we often think of decision making the way that a lot of people approach marriage. They they think of marriage as like the engagement and planning a wedding and then the wedding day and forget everything that comes after that. And we can approach decision making in the same way where it's like all the process leading up, we make it and it's done. And so reflecting on what happens afterwards and uh, and the ongoing character development that happens in this is so good. We've covered a lot today, uh, talking about your book and decision making. Uh, just before we go, what is just one thing you want to leave our listeners with? Oh, goodness. One thing. Oh, my, my. Well, I mean, I feel like the word the word of the Lord was um, clear to me in the scriptures this morning. So I'll just share what the Lord gave me. I can find it. Romans. Yes. So Romans 13. Um, I just love what, what Paul has to say to the church in Rome. Besides this, so Romans 13, 11 through 12. Besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from your sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than we first believed. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. So let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. I love that this morning. It was such a refreshing word to say. Those of you who are weary from decision making, those of you who are weary from asking and waiting for God to give clarity when he hasn't given clarity or waiting on God to open up doors or to, you know, to give relief or clarity in a health situation or whatever it is that you're wrestling with. I just love the gospel hope of salvation is nearer to us today than when we first believed. Hmm. And that sense of press on the the day is coming. The night is, the night is leaving. The day is coming. The son of righteousness is coming back. And if that's the case, in light of that, you know, we can we can put off darkness and put on light and make decisions that advance the kingdom of God and bring his glory to those because he's coming. He's coming back um, and he's going to set all things right. And um, and I love C.S. Lewis. I love what he says in Weight of Glory. He's you know, he talks all about what's coming and the glory that's going to come and and what we're, you know, the home that we're made for. And then he, he, he ends the essay on or close to ends the essay on. But the cross comes before the crown and tomorrow is a Monday morning. Like glory is coming, but there's work to be done. Mm, and so yeah. in light of the, the the promised salvation that is coming, the full, um, the full consummation of the kingdom of God, in light of that, let's go make decisions that glorify him. Yeah, that's excellent. Well, thank you so much for that. And thank you for your work in the book. Uh, it really is excellent. And I uh, highly recommend people go pick up a copy. I will have the book linked in the show notes so that you can find it there and order your copy there uh, to the book, Demystifying Decision-Making, A Practical Guide. Uh, other than the book, uh, how can people follow up with you, get connected with you or learn more about your work? Absolutely. So I have a blog. It's just amyjoseph.blog. Um, I think. <laughs> um, so I write there pretty regularly. Um, I'm on Facebook. I'm not on Instagram trying to keep my lanes of distraction closed mm. as much as possible. Um, so yeah, those would probably be it. The blog is probably the best way um, to kind of follow. Okay. I think my email's on there and all that kind of stuff too. So. Cool. All right. Well, I'll also have the, uh, the blog to, uh, Amy's blog linked in the show notes as well. So you guys who are interested in getting the book and following her blog, you can just click the link in the description to the show notes and you can get all of that there. Once again, Amy, I just want to thank you so much. I really enjoyed this conversation and appreciate your time here with us on filter. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it, Aaron. Thanks for listening. I hope this episode provided you with biblical clarity to live with confidence in our confusing world. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, please share it with others, post about it on social media, or leave a rating or review. To catch up the latest from me, you can go to my website, AaronChamp.com. While you're there, subscribe to my newsletter so that you can be updated anytime I share new content. You can also follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Aaron M. Champ. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time. Until then, hold fast to the